Thanks, Tyson. And yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, so just to give a little background of who I am, because uh, uh, I've worked with Kevin Powell for three years, and I was recruited to do, to validate uh, protocols in the, in the, in the National Phylloxera Management uh, Protocol. And Kevin has been looking at validating those protocols because they were uh, established, uh, they were written um, about a decade ago. And when he was looking at, at this work, so that's how I came into working with Phyloxera and I've learned a great deal from him. And at the, at the time when, when, when I came in, uh, we were also working with a technical officer who has worked with Kevin for over uh, 20 years. So there's really great capacity there and a lot of knowledge that we have got from Kevin. So that has not gone into waste. And the phylloxera research is continuing with a team in a collaborative and, um, and the team, it's, it's going to be a lot of, it's a multidisciplinary team that, will in, that involves myself as the research scientist and Bani Kamodi as the technical officer based at Rather Glen. So we are actually driving the research at Rather Glen. And Paul Cunningham is our project manager who is, uh, who is quite, quite a, a, a keen scientist and is pushing for this um, research to go on for the next 40, I mean, for the next 10 years. So he's got a vision on what areas we should be able to cover. And at the moment in this, we have a three year project that has been funded by Wine Australia and I'm going to touch on the activities that we are going to be covering that really are going to open up a lot of sort of questions because research really asks it answers questions but it also asks questions and it may unravel a lot of things that we do not know about phylloxera and I'll, I'm going to touch about that in the current process in the current project that we'll be going uh, that is currently going on. Um, so my talk is going to be structured about grape phylloxera biology, and uh, most of it uh, has been covered by uh, Daniel and Gary and Tim. So uh, I'm just going to touch on how the biology of phylloxera as affects registration and why we really need to be on our toes, really looking at why we should stop uh, the spread. And then I'm going to mention about the National Phylloxera Management Protocols, which is really some uh, work that has been going on in the, next, in the past three years when I got to start working on phylloxera. And some of the, uh, of the changes that could be happening in, in, that could be incorporated in the management protocol based on the research that we have done. And then I'm going to touch about early detection approach, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, Daniel talked a lot about the risks and why we need to have an early detection and, 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 and also we need to find out what is important in terms of when, if the earlier we detect phylloxera in a vineyard, the, the slower we would uh, stop the spread. And then I'm also going to touch about the current research. Uh, so what is grape phylloxera? So one of the things that perhaps I need to qualify in, from the discussions in the, in the previous session, uh, grape phylloxera only attacks, at this the ev evidence from research, grape phylloxera attacks vitis species uh, at the moment. All the vitis species, including the ornamental vines, are carriers of phylloxera. And phylloxera first instars, so the, the phylloxera develops from an egg, so the adults lay eggs, all of them are females. It undergoes a sexual reproduction. And an adult lays, can lay up to 200 eggs, actually that's a typo. Uh, it's, an, an adult can lay up to 200 eggs in its lifetime. The lifetime of phylloxera, another question I think that came up from, the, uh, from, from our discussion, uh, an, uh, a crawler, which is the most active stage, can survive for up to 20 days without food and at least 80, eight days, eight to 20 days without food. So that's really means that if someone has been to the Yarra Valley and walks on the, in the vineyards and phylloxera crawls in and the clothes are not washed or disinfested, that 
that's fasting that can survive for up to eight days, depending on the temperature without food. So the risk is really high. And you only need one insect to cause an infestation. So that's how really we, the, 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 the risk is quite high because only one insect can spread an infestation. And the, the, fall, the, the, the fast insta will be looking for a host plant to feed on. Once the crawler attaches on a feeding site, it remains on that feeding site until it dies. That's a pretty boring life for phylloxera, but that's how really the, the life cycle happens. It will, uh, the, the crawler will be walking to look for a potential feeding site. And the um, research done by Greg Buchanan uh, showed that phylloxera can walk to uh, up to 100 kilometers in a season. So phylloxera overwinters in, during the colder season, but in the active season in summer, phylloxera will, can, can travel up to 100 kilometers. So that, those are studies that were done by Greg Buchanan. So in, in hindsight, we, the, we are not sure how that happens. It could be uh, most of the vectors that, uh, that, that Daniel talked about could be human vector, they could be you know, wind, uh, there, there are all those factors that can uh, facilitate the fast instance to, to move. Um, the life cycle in Australia, as I've, as I've mentioned, the, the insect has, goes through an asexual reproduction, the, 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 and there are 83 endemic genetic strains that are known. This, this was work I'm going to mention about that in the next slide. And in Australia, there are 49 root feeding uh, phylloxera, and that's the dominant life stage you know, in, in Australia that causes damage on the, on the root vines. So these are 49 distinct genetic strains, so they have distinct DNA characteristics. Uh, and currently, we are using seven genetic strains for research. G38 is a new detection in the King Valley, uh, but uh, Kevin uh, has been doing research with the fast six. Uh, for, for quite a number of, uh, for a long time, but we have added G38 in our collection now. Um, so I'm, I, I'm pretty sure perhaps Kevin has, um, would have shown what, what really, what do you see in a vineyard that has phylloxera? So we have the below ground symptoms, and I think uh, Tim did mention about that. What do we look for when we really dig out the roots. So what, what we are looking for are nodosities. That's a classic symptom of phylloxera. Once you dig out the roots, so what you find are nodosities. And those nodosities, nodosities are, it's a response. When phylloxera feeds on the roots of the vines, the vine responds by causing galls on the roots. And that's where you find most of the galls feeding on. And that's one of the things that you would be able to see when you dig out the vines, and they, it's, it's, they, they're quite small, so you would need a hand lens to be able to identify them. Uh, and in, in all the roots, you'll find tuberosities, and as I've mentioned, one adult can lay up to 200 eggs, so what you find is, if you have like two, three adults on a root piece, so you, you, you would be able to see a cluster of eggs and intermediate stages of phylloxera, which is really observable. You can observe through the naked eye because you'll see a yellow color on the roots. So it's, it's very easy to see in a heavily infested vine. And in, it, as, as phylloxera causes, continues to cause damage, then you're going to see root necrosis and loss and dying of vines. And those are the classic below the ground symptom. And Leaf galls, uh, the leaf galling strains will cause that sort of characteristic on the root, on the leaves. And uh, we have seen a few leaf galls in, in, in the King Valley in the past few seasons. So this, the leaf galls do not cause any, any um, as far as research has shown, or the, 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 the leaf gall um, cycle of phylloxera, the leaf galling do not cause any, any sort of um, 
damage and it's very localized and it only happens either when it's very wet or the research has shown it's only when it's very wet or the conditions are favorable. So that's, that's the leaf galling strain is not a very, uh, it's not something that at the moment that, uh, that, that has caused a lot of concern because it's quite, quite localized and has only been found in one or two vineyards in the King Valley. And the other classic symptoms are weed undergrowth and stunted growth. So if you find that some of the leaves, some of this, the, the vines do not reach the wire at the top, so you see that sort of uh, stunted growth, that could be one of the symptoms as well. And early yellowing and dead vines, as I have mentioned. So classic symptoms. But as we say, these symptoms will take years to show up. And one of the, uh, the, the current research is looking at how can we detect phylloxera before we see this? Because when, this is, when these symptoms are, are there already, it means that phylloxera, as Tyson said, could have been there years before it was actually detected. All right, phylloxera genetic strains and why they are important. Uh, at the moment, what I've highlighted in blue are the strains that we are maintaining in the lab. And this shows, or that, that uh, the, 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 the clades, as, as they're called, we see they, we have all come from one ancestor, that's the phylloxera uh, ancestors, but they're different, we could call them like races <laughs> to make it simple. They are different races, but they are the same, but they have different characteristics. They have different virulent characteristics. And in virulence here, I mean that they, they can multiply quicker and lay as more eggs when they find a successful <coughs> root piece to feed on. And G1 and G4 have been referred to as super clones because they multiply very quickly. And we find that's it, that this, you know, in, in, la, in the lab when we when we, when we are mass rearing them, G1 and G4 do extremely well on on roots because we use on roots to, to propagate the insects so that we can have them for research. So G1 and G4 are pretty, they reproduce very quickly compared to the other strains. And one of the reasons why Kevin chose this is to, to be able to compare the virulent characteristics. G19 is quite slow to produce. <laughs> and on, 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 on Vitis, Vinifera, and G7 and G30 are quite moderate. So we've, and the current studies that we have done, uh, Ginger Corossi, who worked with Kevin previously, did some dry heat treatments, and we have also recently done some dry heat treatments, and we find that those genetic strains vary in the way they respond to heat treatments. So for example, G19 and G20 and G30 fast instars survived when subjected to 45 degrees for five minutes compared to G1 and G4 and G7 that were quite susceptible. So you see that there's that variation in the way there is the, the genetic strains respond to heat and chemical treatments, which is what we are trying to, con to manage them. So it is very important, and in the next project, we are going to be looking at which genetic strain is where. In all the 83 genetic strains are present in the Northeast PIZ. In the Yarra Valley, uh, current uh, information shows that we only have G1. And it's very important because this determines what rootstock the growers need to adopt. As, I show, uh, as I'll show you in the next slide, uh, Kevin did some work on rootstocks and found that there is also variation in how the different genetic strains respond to different rootstocks. So for instance, this, this study done in glass houses showed that G1, G4, and all the six strains are tolerant to the Ramsey rootstock and their resistance to Bona. But if you look at where we have for example, if we take 110 Richter, so we find that G1 and G4 are tolerant, G7 and G19 and G30 are resistant. 
So we find that different rootstocks, uh, different genetic strains also respond differently to rootstocks. And this is one of the research that will be going on to find out what's really happening, what are the interactions between the different rootstocks and the genetic strains. And that's, that's really a long-term uh, research because there are quite a number of rootstocks and we have, only, uh, we have only been focusing on the six genetic strains, so we do not know really what's happening with the other 80, 83 minus six genetic strains. So it's really quite, um, it's, it's, it is, this would be a long-term research project that will be going on. Um, so on the next slide, I think uh, oh, Daniel covered beautifully the risks. So, so what are the risks of carrying phylo uh, phylloxera? And I've said you only need one insect to, to transfer an infest, uh, to, to, to cause an infestation. So if you have a tractor coming from the Yarra Valley and it's not treated and, or it's not properly treated and a crawler is hiding somewhere, so you only need that to, bring, to really cause an infestation. So, and they are all potential. So where I have those yellow, um, the, the insects, those are all potential vectors. And I think I won't go dwell on that because Daniel covered that so beautifully. So, but what I wanted to show there is how, because crawlers are very, so as I, as I mentioned, they are really looking, they're, they're, they're walking around crawling, looking for a feeding site. So they would be above the ground, uh, especially if a root is very heavily infested, they would be coming up above the ground to go to the next root or under the ground to, to go to, to find a suitable site where there's no competition. So the risk is very high, especially in summer when the populations are quite high and the, the, the first instances are moving up and down from the soil through the stem and onto the root and the foliage. So the risk is quite high at around that time in midsummer. Um, so I'm going to touch on the disinfestation procedures. So what do we do to ensure that the um, the, and the research, what's what the, the the protocols that we have validated and what they have shown, and actually most, much of it was also covered previously. But what's highlighted there are the protocols that we have validated. Um, and the first one was movement of grapevine and cutting rootlings, um, moving cuttings or rootlings or, or what do we need to do? So we conducted some studies and we replicated what would ideally be happening in the field where we have a bundle of the roots and the protocol um, recommends dipping the the bundle in water at 50 degrees for one, uh, for 30 minutes or 54 degrees for five minutes. And this procedure works. So where we have a tick, it means that that was validated as true. Uh, the next one, the diagnostic samples. So the cold treatment is the, is the recommended procedure. And we did some um, trials and at four degrees and minus 20. Because uh, Kevin had got, or had been asked to, uh, some people would, uh, I, I think some growers were using four degrees, and he asked, yeah, you know, he, want, he wanted to validate that, you know, putting in the fridge, putting a sample in the fridge, for example, for smoke taint research, for four degrees, we found that that does not kill phylloxera. It's got to be um, minus 20. That's the effective. That's, that's the procedure that really kills phylloxera, minus 20 for at least 12 hours. So we found survival at six, at, at six hours. So it's got to be at least 12 hours at minus 20. Um, so the, the, the smoke taint research also uses homogenization and we found that homogenization also kills phylloxera. At 10 seconds for 10,000 uh, uh, rates per minute, 20 seconds for 5,000 rates per minute, and 30 seconds for, uh, at 2,000 rates per minute. So mostly the grapevine, the, the grapes are uh, in the smoke taint research that they use homogenizations. And so it was important for us to confirm that that really is working. 
Uh, the next one is effectiveness of STEAM. And we looked at what really happens when you increase the distance, because as we know, the more STEAM is actually 100, is 100 degrees centigrade. But the, we found that the, the, the farther you move the source of STEAM from the source of from the target site that needs to be disinfested, the lower the temperature. So it's really those little considerations like, like um, the scenarios that Daniel put across that if, if, we, are, if we want to disinfest phylloxera, the, the, the caution should be that the distance is as close to the surface being disinfested as possible. Otherwise, the temperature decreases it and it no longer reaches that required threshold to kill phylloxera. Uh, but STEAM was, uh, was perfectly if effective in killing phylloxera. Uh, so I jumped a slide there. Okay, the next one we, we validated was the effectiveness of hot water. And we found that 50 degrees was, F was, was effective. 50 degrees and above was effective in achieving 100% kill. And this was also effective across the seven genetic strains. Uh, dry heat treatment. So uh, Daniel did mention about this. So there are two recommendations. One using 45 degrees for 75 minutes. So that was effective, but 40 degrees for 120 minutes was not effective against two genetic strains. Again, here we see the differences in the response to genetic strains. So, and that's, that needs increasing the temperature to 135 minutes was, was what was effective across the, seven, the six genetic strains we tested. The footwear and disinfestation and handheld tools, and that's, that's one thing that's a discussion that has come up uh, in the, during the discussion. Um, so really, I think the, the, one of the greatest risks is really movement of people, uh, tourism, and you know, mo how, how, do we how do we ensure that footwear disinfestation works? The current recommendation says uh, it's 2% for 30, for 30 seconds, followed by a thorough rinse in water. And we found that that actually does not kill phylloxera. Uh, we found at least for across all the six genetics strains, using the recommended proce uh, procedure, 50% of, of fast instances survived. And we went ahead and increased the, temp the, the time to 60 seconds, and that killed phylloxera, but without, without a water rinse. So that, may, that means that when we are disinfesting the footwear, we will, we will uh, be on the foot bath for 60 seconds, but not rains. And that means that we are going to have residues and wrecking of the boots. And that has been a major concern. And in the next project, we are, we are, I'm going to talk about other, looking for other alternative disinfestation, because I think uh, it's, it's not, bleach doesn't smell very nice when, it remains on the foot on the foot here. So we are going to be screening for different uh, disinfestants. And one of the other things we found is when these fast instances survive, we put them back on the roots, and we found that they actually uh, survive and develop to fecund adults. So that means that they survive the treatment. You put them on the roots, so you might think that we have disinfested the footwear and moved to the next vineyard, but if they find a food source, they will continue laying eggs, despite the fact that we have disinfested. So, and that was really an important finding that, um, that, that, that ensures that we really make sure that the rinsing process does not happen. Okay, what about clothing and uh, a hot wash cycle when temperature reaches either 54 degrees for five minutes is effective or 50 degrees for 30 minutes. But a literature search shows that some of the washing machines do not reach that temperature. They, they do not hold that temperature for that long. For example, we found that though the Hoover washing machine has a 50 degree um, 
cycle, so it does not maintain that temperature over 55, so it remains as 43. And it's really important to be able to recognize what washing machine, again, that you have, and whether you're going to use this as a disinfestation process. And the, the fact is, is, to ensure that the temperature reaches the required 54 for five minutes or 50 for 30 minutes. And for hearts and knees, knee pads or fly screens, so we found that mortin uh, can kill fast instances when sprayed for at least five seconds from a, mini from a minimum distance of five centimeters. So again, we find that the longer the, 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 longer the distance from the food source, um, from the spray, just like the steam treatments to the target, then the, that, that efficacy is lost when, 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 the, when the target and the source of the disinfestant is. Um, so what are we doing now? So as I've mentioned, bleach is one of the priorities that we are looking at so that we might we know because wrecking of both bleach is actually because we, we, um, we've been going out to the field a lot and they, you know, if we've got growers always disinfesting the, 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 uh, on bleach, that wrecks boots very quickly. And it's, it's not a very nice smell. And I'm going to mention what we are doing, what we've done so far. And one of the other things is we are going to validate the fermentation protocol and we are doing a, 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 an extensive survey where, survey where we are uh, mapping out the genetic strains in the King Valley. And this is going to be quite an important finding because um, it, a few years ago, Kevin went out to the field and found that the, uh, and found different genetic strains. G King Valley has been known to have G4 but Kevin went out to the field and found that other geno genotypes have been detected in that area. And he, and he, and he put up this proposal to, to resurvey the King Valley again. And this study is going to be a prototype to see whether that can be extended to other regions in, the, in Victoria, because it's going to inform on really what's happening with the genetic strains, what's, what's moving, are they moving, or what's really happening? And that's going to shed light into really what's, what, what's happening. Because the previous study was done 20 years ago. And as we know, insects are pretty adaptable and they move. So we, this, is, this research is going to inform whether there has been movement within, within the King Valley. And it's going to be quite an important finding. Uh, and we are going to do some rootstock uh, studies where we are comparing in field in vitro and glasshouse rootstock using G38. That's the new, newly detected uh, genetic strain. And we want to see whether what the results we find in the field, how do they correlate with the lab and compare that so that we have an informed decision on, what's, what's on, on, class, on classifying the different rootstocks using, using that one strain. And then we're also going to screen the seven genetic strains using 5C Teleki that has been recommended for us to test because it, uh, that, that's a new rootstock that hasn't been tested against phylloxera. And as I've mentioned, early detection is one of the key things that this project is going to look at so that phylloxera can be detected as early before it starts moving into, into different uh, regions. And one of the, um, again, on collaboration, um, we're going to look at uh, ENOS, which is, uh, and that's related to sniffer dogs. Um, Kevin did some work with sniffer dogs and found that sniffer dogs can actually smell phylloxera. But we want to take that further and see, really, if we have a, if, if, if dogs can sniff, then we can use the Ninos, which is a handheld device to see if, if that can be used as a, as a way to detect phylloxera. And again, lamp technology uh, that will be used to, to also, it's a DNA-based uh, technology that can be used for early detection. 
and UAV using drones. That's some that's some work that we're going uh, to uh, that, that that's going to be done in collaboration with BV, and uh, the and we're also looking at management. So far, Phyloxera does not have a control. It's it's really managing it. And one of the things that uh, we're going to also look at is look at potential for using biocontrol agents. And Ray Kuang, who is a, who is a bio uh, who is a biocontrol specialist, is looking at a literature review to see whether we can either have a classical biocontrol project and and why that has not been exp explored. And that could be something to watch in the future. And that would be really fantastic if we could have some. Some, some, some form of control in an integrated management approach. And the other thing that we're going to look at is the phylloxera biology. So far, the biology, uh, biological studies were conducted by Kim actually and uh, Greg Buchanan, but we want to shed light into the different genetic strains and compare the life table studies and, and unravel whether there are differences in the reproduction of the diff and the reproductive capabilities of the different uh, genetic strains, and also look at phylloxera genomics to see to to see what's really that's that also ties to the genotype mapping. And so, in winding down, so this I just want to highlight on this, and I would like us I would like you to be involved in. For example, if you find that there's something that you would like us to test that you think could kill phylloxera as an alternative for footwear disinfestation, we are, we are really happy to go and test it. So far, we have screened 23 products, and we were looking at practicality, cost, and availability, you know, because we, we would like the growers to find what, what is really available and practical and also effective in terms of cost. And when the screening procedure was, is that practical? If it's no, then we did not go ahead. And that was just through a, a, a literature search and what has been used as a foot bath in the past. And if, if it's available, then we went ahead and used a 30 seconds with a rinse. Because the other thing we want to do is to make this efficient. Because as, as, as you all know, standing on a foot bath for one minute is quite a long time. So we want to see if we can reduce that to 30 and also ensure that it doesn't really, we don't carry the smells with us or it's not, you know, it's not going to wreck our boots. And so if that worked, then we screen all the seven genetic strains to see that it all works across the seven genetic strains. If it doesn't, then we go ahead and not rinse, but using the same 30 seconds. And if that worked, then we go ahead and not rinse and increase to 60 seconds and then um, if, if, it, if that doesn't work, then we stop there because we don't want to increase the time. But so far, what has worked with this product, with the three products, or with four, Dettol was actually quite good, but I don't know how that is going to be taken up because it's also got a very interesting smell. And we went ahead and screened these highlighted ones in blue across the seven genetic strains. And that's going to really tell us, uh, we, we will have a, a survey on what, and that's going to be in, in consultation with the uh, biosecurity team on what really is applicable. And that's something that is currently going on. And it's quite interesting because we were talking about salinity uh, yesterday with Cheryl and Tyson. And one of the things that we thought was possible to test was common salt. And we made a, a solution of seawater, very high concentration, but phylloxera still survived on that, which was quite interesting. So it's been a lot of really what, what can we do and we would like you to really be involved and let us know what it is that you would like us to test. And lastly, early detection. So uh, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, Kevin did these studies and found that dogs can smell phylloxera, we would like you to, we're going to be doing a, conducting a survey to see, do we want dogs in our vineyards? So, and this, this it will be nice to hear your responses. We're going to be doing a, a, a monkey survey to see whether that, a survey to see whether that's really practical. Um, it's really a stop, go, 
sort of survey to see whether that would be applicable. Yet, yeah, and think that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Yep. Does it make any difference whether the water that you're adding those products to is cold or hot? If you use hot water and you add those products to it, does it potentially make them more effective in that way? You don't have to be uh, in the food after 60 seconds if you've got a shorter time to effectively kill off the phylloxera? Uh, no. So the question was, do we use hot water to, to, to look at efficacy? No, we, don't. we do not because we... What we are doing is we want to replicate what's currently happening in the field. So because what's currently happening is we add bleach to cold water. So we want to replicate that before we go further to the hot water uh, addition. The only time we use hot water is if the product, for example, there's one product that could not dissolve in cold water and we first heat the water and dissolve it and then we let it cool before we do the treatments. Yeah. Yeah. Else? I guess the hot water too, out in the field, rather than the main hot for a certain period of time when we're talking about the efficacies that we know of, yeah. 54 degrees or 50 degrees, so yeah. that'd be a difficulty with multiple people going for a foot part too. But Sorry. Yeah, but the dog could detect it. Is there a certain concentration that the blocks are have to reach before the dog can detect it? Or? No, the, the research that, uh, that Kevin did were phylloxera were put on plates, and there were 100 phylloxera on a plate, and then 50. Um, so to see if reducing the, the numbers would influence the detection, but that was, so they were still able to, to detect. So there's evidence there that they can detect, but that did not go beyond the Petri dish. So it did not look at, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, it didn't go there. So that's why the next, the next stage was to look at really the plants and that's what the ENOS activity is going to the, the research Kevin is going to do, Kevin Fania is going to look at, move it, move, move it to a potted plant to see if, if, um, if volatiles can be picked up using a machine when they're produced from a plant rather than, you know, because we know that from chemical, um, chemical ecology that when insects feed on a plant, the plants react by producing volatiles and that's what the enos uh, detector would be able to pick up. 